Welcome to Digital Royalties and Rights, which can sometimes be a bit of a confusing conversation, I guess, in, uh, you know, in today's crazy world. Um, <clears throat> and welcome to Jazz Congress in general. My name is Denny Stilwell. I'm going to be, I'm from Mac Avenue Records. I'm going to be kind of guiding our esteemed panelists here through, um, through the Digital Royalties and Rights conversation. So um, I just um, would like the panelists to introduce themselves quickly. If, Tinko, if we can start with, start with you. Hi, um, hi everyone. Um, I'm primarily an independent artist manager. I've been working in jazz and independent music since 1998. Um, I came from a live music background in Scotland, and I also worked at the Jazz Cafe in London. Um, I've worked in catalog for reissue labels like Strut Records when we were just at the cusp of digitizing a lot of music. Um, but I ended up coming over here six years ago to work with Shugi Otis and Sony Legacy, and that's sort of immersed myself back into the jazz world here in New York. Um, so I currently have a management company. I represent artists like Gary Bartz, um, Mark Carey, Melanie Charles, so quite a wide range of like legacy and developing artists and established people. Um, but I took quite a hiatus um, for about a year because I was quite interested in the rights landscape in America and how it's so vastly different than the rest of the world. And have been doing a lot of outreach in this past year, trying to help artists understand this environment and how to access as many of the revenue streams that are there for them as possible. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Bob Ruderman. Um, uh, I uh, started out as a jazz saxophone player, moved to New York to do music and film, uh, quickly got a job at Sony Music Entertainment, had a whole variety of roles there, and then moved over to Cobalt Music seven years ago. I oversee all of our digital partnerships, all of our commercial relationships with digital services, very involved in uh, the overall op operations and strategy of the company. Um, and I'm also on the Mechanical Licensing Collective Board of Directors. Um, and um, and that's, 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 that's my background. I'm Richard James Burgess. I'm the President and CEO of A2IM, which is the American Association of Independent Music. And um, actually, my background is a musician. I was a drummer, uh, still am a drummer. I was a studio musician for many years. I was a touring musician for years, um, producer for a long time, and manager. So I've been pretty much right through the business. The reason I took this job is because I felt that you know musicians uh, were getting screwed, as it were, in the digital age, and you know maybe I could do something about it. And so that's what A2M tries to do. We say we're about advocacy, education, and community, and uh, we, you know, we're most of what we do is uh, a large part of what we do is advocacy, where we're out there trying to get the laws uh, changed to become more beneficial to artists and labels. And Richard, in your position, you also sit on the board of Sound Exchange oh as yeah. well, right? That's right. Yeah. I sit on the board of Sound Exchange, and uh, so anything I say is completely biased about Sound Exchange. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I love Sound Exchange. I think it's a great organization. And actually, funnily enough, I'm a member of PPL, which is the British, uh, the British um, equivalent of Sound Exchange, as it were. So. Good morning, everyone. My name is Roberta Arnold. Uh, um, I'm vested member of the American Federation of Musicians. I became a member of 1968 and a contractor. I did about um, over 100, maybe 150 radio and television commercials, a couple of uh, soundtracks for feature films, some themes for television programs, I've produced uh, about two dozen jazz recordings for various labels around the world. Um, I have a publishing company with uh, about 60, between 62 and 65 titles. I became a member of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences 27 years ago, and a couple of years ago, I've been, I was drafted 
to become an advocate. I've been asked to become an advocate for a long time, and I finally bit it. And I'm so happy to sh be able to share the information that I'm going to be learning here next year when we have Advocacy Day. I want to encourage everyone to, to keep your ears and your eyes open <coughs> about what is happening with the American Federation of Musicians. Uh, in the last negotiation, we lost the um, negotiation to do any kind of reuse streaming, and it's important that in the next negotiation, which will be in two years, that we get our word in, we get to hear, they get to hear what we need to hear, and they need to do what we, they need to do for us. So I'm really delighted to be here today, and thank you so much, everyone. Great, thank you. So I think, um, you know, the, I want to start off by just kind of getting a, you know, kind of getting a sense of, of who's in the room in, you know, in general. How many in the room here are songwriters? Okay, good. And I'm going to make the assumption that many or most are signed up with one of the performing rights societies, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. How many are not? of songwriters are not yet signed up with a performing rights society. Okay, so a few. Just a few. Three. Of everyone in the room, of performers or songwriters, how many are not yet signed up or signed up for sound exchange? Okay, so we have some performers who are not, not yet signed up for Sound Exchange. Um, and I should say Sound Exchange or PPL. Richard mentioned PPL. PPL is the, uh, is the UK European version of, of Sound Exchange. How many people in the room of performers or writers are part of a union like the AFM or SAG AFTRA? Okay, so most, most who are performers are, are not. And how many people in the room are familiar with the Music Modernization Act, the three basic components of it, and specifically the Mechanical Licensing Collective? So a, a few. Okay, good. All right. Um, there's. So I want to. I want to start by. You know, there. There are two. You know, in the in the digital space, there are two essential royalty streams, um, and uh, for. Uh, for artists and for songwriters. And there's the master royalty, which is uh, paid to the, the master rights holders and the performers, and then there's the publishing royalty and the, and the publishing part. So we kind of want to separate those two things out, I think, for this conversation, and we're going to start by talking about performance royalties and, and, master, and, and master rights royalties. And then we'll get to publishing and songwriter royalties in the second half of the conversation. So I think all of us agreed when we looked at the schedule, we're like, like really, we're gonna cover this in, you know, in 50 minutes, right, to leave time for questions? And it can be a complicated, complex landscape. So getting through all of this in, you know, in this amount of time is probably gonna be a challenge, you know, for us in general. So we're gonna try to hit some broad brush strokes. We're gonna leave some time at the, um, at the end of the session for, for questions, which we kinda hope that you, you know, we'll all have. Um, would you, Tinku, would you uh, s be willing to start us off and give us a general overview of uh, performance royalties and sound exchange and PPL and kind of start the narrative there? Sure. So, um, as, as Denny's saying, this is not about songwriters, what, what I'm going to talk about just now. And the main organization in America who deal with these performance rights are, is Sound Exchange. Um, there's also AARC who deals with a component of, I think it's home taping and reproduction side of that. But um, Sound Exchange didn't exist. It's a very young PRO and it came about with the advent of streaming because streaming created a revenue stream which is called non-interactive. It's, it's your digital radio, it's your Pandora, it's your Sirius XM. 
and there wasn't a mechanism in America to collect this type of right. Um, in the rest of the world, you have companies like um, Richard mentioned PPL in the UK. Um, there's um, who's at ReForward in Canada, I think. There, there, there's you know it, it, they they deal with something called neighboring rights, and that might be a, a term that a lot of people in America don't really understand. Um, it's a right that um, is been given to musicians across the world through something called the Convention of Rome, which protects the performer's right to reserve, to, to extract income from this, from when your music's played on radio, <coughs> TV, and now streaming. The problem is America didn't opt into the Convention of Rome 50 years ago, so tr we don't have this reciprocal agreement with the rest of the world. You record a track here and it's played on the BBC in the UK. As a musician, you don't see that revenue. Um, there is a lot of work with Congress, with a lot of bodies trying to challenge that law, but streaming created a revenue stream that didn't exist in America before, and Sound Exchange set up to collect this. Um, now, Sound Exchange very recently put some great tools together, um, and I have to encourage anyone, if you're a session musician, if you're putting out your own featured works, um, you have to pay attention to these companies because money will build up over a number of years in different societies around the world. And um, sound exchange are fantastic. They're coming and, and actually proactively reaching out to find the rights holders. Um, there's a bit of a difference between how sound exchange deal with this here and in the rest of the world. And, I tend to encourage people to look at as many of these societies as they can, and particularly in markets where they have radio play and high numbers in streaming. Um, this is gets even more complicated because that right is broken into three components. You have your performers part, you have your master rights holders part, and then you have a part for non-featured artists, for session musicians. This money takes a journey across across the globe, you know? So as a featured artist, your money goes to sound exchange. That money is split between whoever the label is. That might be Mac Avenue, that might be you if you're an independent rights holder. Um, and your performance as a musician, 5% um, of that money is then sent to AFM and SAG-AFTRA fund, which Roberta might be able to speak to a little more in depth, and it sits there on an unclaimed royalty list. Um, there's a lot of buzz talk right now in this industry about unclaimed royalties, but one thing that is important to understand is you have to go into these platforms, you have to join, you have to go and collect your performances, you have to find them in the platforms and collect them, so metadata, is now possibly the most important thing as a rights holder, as an artist that you need to be thinking about, to think about how many people are touching on it, whether it's Spotify, Pandora, whether it's Sirius XM or the BBC Radio in the UK. And um, there's a lot of support you can also get from these societies. Um, but unfortunately, there's a tendency for us to overlook the neighboring rights in America because we haven't opted into the Convention of Rome, and it is this new industry and in, in streaming that's creating this revenue and this issue. Just, just to kind of drive the point home about Sound Exchange for a moment. Sound Exchange collects royalties from Pandora and SiriusXM and from other internet radio um, uh, radio s services. And just to drive the point home. 45% of those royalties go to the master rights holder, Correct. right? Which is usually the label, but if it's a artist-owned project, can go to the artist. 45% goes to the featured performer, Correct. right? And then 5%, and this is kind of an um, important point, and Richard, maybe you could talk about this too, but 5% is paid to AFM. It's paid to AFM SAG-AFTRA and goes into a general fund, right? For non-featured performers. So if you're not the featured performer on the you know, on on the uh, on the recording, there is a fund that is set up to distribute royalties to non-featured performers. 
So we were having a conversation before this morning about that and, and how there's a possibility actually that jazz artists might be at a disadvantage in collecting monies from those, you know, from those funds, um, you know, because a, a lot of the pop and rock artists and the, the sidemen there are, are um, you know, that are members of, of the union might collect those funds. But I think the point is that if you're not a member of the union, right, and if you're not signed up, you don't have a chance to collect those funds at all. Is that? Well, no, you, you can still collect them um, as, as a non-member. They're going to take a, a due from that money before they give it to you. I, um, I mean, we've seen the problem come up with both union and non-union members. I personally think it's got a lot more to do with how much control each individual has on registering their performance or their contribution to a, a musical work. Um, most musicians, well, who here has ever filled in a split sheet or a collaboration agreement in the studio? Absolutely no one can put their hands up there, but that right there is one of the biggest reasons why this money starts to get hard to track. Because if you don't register it there, and there's not a mechanism for you to register it with a fund like AFM and sag -Astra, they don't know who to give it to. So it will just sit there. If you're lucky and it's a prominent recording, your name might come up on the list. But sound exchange, and that's one thing that I think is something that sound exchange can maybe embrace. Um, as they're developing new ways for artists to um, access um, their catalog <laughs> on the platform, is if there was a mechanism for them to be able to say, hey, I am the session musician on this performance. That's something that PPL does, and it makes a huge difference to being able to repair the, the data errors that are in the system. Mm -hmm. Because that, that in itself also, you know, if that money's not collected, I, I, I think if I'm right with PPL, what happens is um, you have a trio performance with a jazz group. The featured artist says he's the only featured artist, so that makes the other musicians side men. Um, if those performances are not allocated to those musicians, that money goes to the band leader, number one. And then if that band leader is not collecting that money, it's eventually just going to go back into the system and be redistributed across the main members, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where the money, I'm not sure where the money goes if you don't collect it at PPL, but I do know for myself, I had to submit, I, I went in and groomed all my um, credits on PPL. I mean, I, I have hundreds and hundreds of albums I played on. and. Um, and produced and various different things and I needed to make sure that my data was correct there and it was a pain in the butt to be honest with you but um, if you don't do it you don't get paid so it's really worth doing um, and uh, there's, there are a few wrinkles actually with with PPL as well it's one of the things that or not just PPL but any other um, performing rights organization because we don't because we didn't sign the um, the Rome Convention and because we don't have a terrestrial right in this country we don't get a reciprocal right from other countries that play uh, American music. Um, but, um, the, and this is something, by the way, that HOM is working on, the RAAA is working on, Music First, Sound Exchange. We have these organizations that are trying to get a trust right in this country, but we're up against the uh, NAB, which is a formidable uh, opponent. They have a lot of, uh, uh, they have a very powerful lobby in this country. Um, but. A couple of things are happening. One is that the, the more um, voice-activated speakers come into being, um, the more musicians are getting paid. Because if you ask for, to hear your local radio station on a, on a, a voice-activated speaker on Alexa or something like that, that's a, digital, that's a digital play. And we do get paid for digital plays. So <coughs> I always encourage people to listen digitally. Um, because if you listen on AM, FM radio, then you know, musicians don't get paid. Uh, but the other thing is that if you were born in another country or if you record in another country, there's a possibility of claiming those royalties. Uh, I know a lot of jazz musicians record in Europe and, um, you know, a lot of musicians uh, have, uh, are born other places as well. So these are things that are worth looking at um, uh, if you know uh, you have those kinds of circumstances. You can actually get paid. Uh, for some of those, uh, for some royalties that you might not normally get. Uh, the other thing is that PPL, and I think Tinker pointed this out, but P 
PPL for one, and th th I happen to know more about PPL and sound exchange, but this is true. For, you know, there are variations from all the different um, uh, agencies around the world. Uh, PPL's calculations as to how they split out the royalties between the master rights owner and the the feature performance and the uh, non-feature performance is completely different than sound exchange, but it still works out. You know, it's still money that's yours and worth having. And th just in case it wasn't clear, this one amazing point that, that uh, Richard made there, which is um, where you record your music or your birthright can actually have a significant impact on, on that revenue stream. I mean, simply going across the border to Canada would instantly engage that right, because Canada is a member of the Rome Convention. And I'm not suggesting you start deserting <laughs> the American <laughs> recorded industry, but you know, you tour, you tour internationally, there's, there's opportunities to have master rights deriving from different markets, you know? Yeah. yeah. We'll be hearing from recording studios I about know. the exodus <laughs> of jazz musicians going across the border to Canada to record. Oh, maybe. Or maybe we'll have more live recordings. <laughs> That's my whole <laughs> Right, right. And I just want to interject here. You have a handout in front of you that I forgot yeah. to mention. This could be a little bit of alphabet soup up here. PPL, ASCAP, BMI, SACM, CSAC, right? So we thought it would be helpful to just put a starter kind of, it's kind of a resource starter kit for everybody here that we provided in the handout. So this is not any kind of definitive list of digital rights and royalties. I just want to make that disclaimer up front. But it is uh, pr probably a good place to start. And if you need any further information on the organizations that we're mentioning up here, by all means, there's the web addresses. And you can go and find out you know, what they do or whatever. And if you have questions afterwards, obviously, we'll do our best to, to ask them. We're talking and talking about international. We're you know we're, we're talking about PPL, but is PPL the only organization in Europe that collects uh, performance royalties? Oh no, every, every country pretty much in the world has their own society. Um, you've got Senna in Holland. You've got Spedidam in France. Um, there, I think there's maybe a hundred and fifty odd performing yeah. rights societies, something like that. Um, there's a lot of technology these days. Um, a lot of publishers are starting to co-op neighboring rights services because they have the infrastructure to do it. There's some DIY technology like um, a song trust that's trying to do similar things. Um, I think there's great benefits to a lot of this, but I always have to come back to you, you have to understand the component of search and collect on any of these platforms in order to access any of this information. Um, if you're lucky enough to have an administrator doing this for you, that's great. Chances are you don't in this industry, you know? So um, it's great to familiarize yourself with some of these international societies and also understand some of the other benefits they have for you as touring musicians. They have funds allocated for touring and recording, you know? Um, I think this is a great time to try and access this information as well. I know Sound Exchange has been doing a lot of outreach at jazz festivals, music festivals in general. There's usually reps you can go and talk to and to understand how to walk through all this stuff. So, you know, just pay attention in your environment because I think people are, these societies are really proactively trying to say, hey, you know, we want to talk to you now. And I think Sound Exchange have ma have made a pretty streamlined process for you to be able to submit all of that you know, yeah. if you're the if you're the actual featured artist. They, they oh have they've made some fantastic. So, yeah. And they, they you know their their stated goal is not to have not to hang on to any money. I mean they they want to distribute the money and they want to distribute the money to the the, the rightful people. Um, but you're right they they have a great customer service. Uh, I mean their website's really easy to use. They have um, dozens of people, I think, on staff that to help answer inquiries yeah, and they to do. walk you through stuff. They have, and what, it's close to a billion dollars a year going yeah, through Sound Exchange? Yeah, about a billion dollars um, passes through Sound Exchange and gets distributed every year. So that's, it's, it's um, and even, even if you're a relatively small artist, it's uh, uh, still worth getting, you know, and it all adds up. Well, I was told that by the AF of M that the secondary supplemental uh, distribution last year was $120 million. Mm -hmm. 
is huge. Which is really considerable. And that covers the AF of M SAG AFTRA supplemental funds, which covers um, television, radio, syndication. I mean, the potential if you join the union is enormous because you get the, the first session payment, then you get the potential for reuse, and then you get the, the uh, supplemental distribution that, that I'm very fond of <laughs> because th they did distribute $120 million last year. Um, that's without any digital rights at all. So it's, a, it's really a, a very important thing, I think, for all of us to go back and look at the unions and what they can do for us. Th th there's one thing that underpins all this and segues into the mechanical side of things. Oh, oh sorry. Um, th th there's one thing that really sits between the songwriters and, and the musicians with all of this, which is metadata. And it's, you know, this, I don't know how much we can dig into this, but the metadata is every single bit of information on your music, who played on it, where it was recorded. And it's amazing how much just a simple error, like a spelling mistake in someone's name, can lead to a check sitting at local 802 you know, it comes under the black box income, but metadata, whether you're talking about publishing or recording rights, it's absolutely imperative that you understand how to register this information and what's important. Because whether you're looking to, and this applies to like the, the, the academy, people like this as well, if they, um, your metadata now sits on Discogs, it sits on all music. These are the platforms that the industry will look at to verify whether you own something, whether you're the artist that appeared in all these great performances. So I think that's a key thing to try and focus on as well. And I just, as an aside, I think, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I'm seeing a lot of different companies come forward now with, uh, you know, uh, strategies around credits around, and, and I think it starts from very basic to, to composition credits, mm -hmm. to to uh, performer perform um, <coughs> excuse me performers credits, but it's it's really I think people have are are, are developing multi year plans to try to really replicate the liner notes yeah. experience, and I think that again like tying all of this through you know in the digital world is has so much opportunity to try to. Um, stitch together a more meaningful experience and drive engagement too for for your for for your um, recordings and compositions in the future and try to allow the consumers and fans to try to dig in more and ultimately stream more and consume more and um, you know build up your your uh, your profile with with, with people yeah. yeah I will say uh, th there's a company called Jaxta that just started up that's uh, a credits organization part of the problem is that uh, for the past you know 15 or more years with digital we haven't really had liner notes and uh, so there's quite a lot of recordings that exist that just don't have any credits. And, but I, I will say this, it's really, really important. The responsibility lies in this room uh, in large part because a lot of times these credits are not being gathered. They don't live anywhere. And um, so it's super important if you're recording to make sure that your credits are recorded and, um, and you know, <coughs> they're available. Um, so that as we move into an era, which I think we're moving into now, where these credits are gonna be available online and um, freely available for everybody. I mean, with uh, Bob being on the board of the MLC, we were just talking about that earlier. It's critically important that not only the publishing credits are correct on uh, the MLC's database, but also the recording credits need to be right too because if they exist anywhere, people are gonna tend to use them. And if they're inaccurate, then that, that causes a mispayment or a non-payment, uh, which is uh, problematic for all of us. And you can see a, a, a future where that metadata not just as part of the fan experience and driving engagement, actually could become monetized um, down, mm -hmm. down the road. So especially in genres that are, um, have deeply dedicated f fan bases that, 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 that um, consume and, and stream uh, an incredible amount of, um, you know, uh, exclusively certain genres, you can see other opportunities down the road for, for piggybacking off of that. Oh, JAXTA, J-A-X-S-T-A, and um, you know, they've been rolling for about nearly four years now, 
It's an Australian organization. But Discogs also is another one, is all music. But the, the problem is the accuracy of data. Um, but JAXTA has done a great job from what I can tell. Uh, there are a lot of organizations working on this, by the way. The Recording Academy's done a lot of great work on it. The producer and engineer wing of the Recording Academy uh, has been super active on credits. But there's probably nothing more important than credits once you get past the music. And all of the ba the, ba the underpinning back, to, you know, the broader metadata too, you know, is, uh, let, let me give you an example. Like, so if, if you're going to stream something on uh, through an Alexa device, through the Amazon Echo, um, if you ask for certain kinds of genres or types of, you know, ver very subgenres, um, jazz is a perfect example, um, you're, depending on what, what someone asks for, you want to be able to maximize what's going to get served up as part of that um, voice call because it's not someone just searching through Spotify or Amazon or Apple. Someone's asking for X kind of music or mood. And you know what we're seeing, let's say, with the Amazon team is an incredible amount of, um, of, of favoring of, of um, of, of, of recordings that have really clean metadata that have all of those different attributes associated with them. And they're using third parties like TiVo and Grace Note um, and, and, and Nielsen to try to help augment that metadata. So again, it's as good as the data that you start out with and the genre information, et cetera, that, you're, um, that, that you or your label is, um, is, uh, is memorializing when the music is originally being distributed. And the, and the big point here in terms of, you know, payments, specifically yeah. to artists of, you know, of, of any kind or songwriters of any point, when the metadata isn't accurate, that's one of the problems and why this money ends up in, a, in what we call the black Huge. box, right? Huge. And it yeah. ends up, you know, in the black box is a pool of money that's set aside by whatever society who can't match the money to who it's owed. And so it ends up in a black box, and depending on the society or the organization, they have a policy that says it'll sit there for three years, and if nobody claims it, then they distribute it equally amongst all the members of that society. So the money that could be yours ends up going into somebody else's pocket. You know, and that's the, the, the solution of the, that they have come up with. So having clean metadata is, is, is really important. Is it possible that <coughs> Yeah, sorry about that. I, we, we live in this kind of uh, alphabet soup world. So <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob's on the MLC, so I'll let him explain. <laughs> well, we'll get to that in, in a minute. Is, is that, is that yeah, a, is I that think, look, I think this is a good time to transition. We probably spent about uh, 20 minutes or well, so. Well, I should define it for the lady. It's yeah, the music yeah. licensing oh, committee. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, the, it's the mechanical licensing Me mechanical collective. Mechan You know, it, it, it starts. Like well, it, I mean, it, it, it starts in the studio. Um, you know, a lot of musicians tend to, you know, they have their session, they go away, and six months later they may argue about who the writing split is or the ownership of a track. Generally speaking, that's the start of it. Who contributed what to what part of this this thing? If you don't have that information right. Um, whether you in, whether you put it in CD Baby DistroKid, whether you give it to Mac Avenue to put into their system, it's, it has to be correct. Um, so a, a good way to understand it is go look at some of these platforms like Discogs, like All Music, where you can see, it's, All Music's great actually, it has different search functions where you can say, hey, let me look at, this artist's contribution to session work, to featured recordings. And then you'll start to see the importance of the broader metadata that we're talking about here as well, the, the, the sleeve notes, um, all of that, because not just from a point of view from your fans, you, 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 you need a blueprint on all these platforms these days that are consistent so people get the right information about you. and. I think it's amazing that we're in this world now where we can do that ourselves as an artistic community. You know, 15 years ago, we couldn't do this ourselves. Mm -hmm. We relied on the Cobalts and the Mac Avenues of the world to get the information out there. 
but we we have a tendency to overlook it at the most basic place, which is in the studio. And and so you know, I I, I try and encourage artists to use things like collaboration agreements, split sheets, things that create a paper trail that you can actually then track back your ownership, your contribution to anything you've done, you know? So I, think, I, I think maybe um, if, you're, if you're an artist and you're, and you're signed up, you know, with TuneCore, or if you have a record label, or if you have a direct deal, you know, with Apple or whatnot, you'll input, you know, a certain amount of, uh, amount of data. You'll yes, you do. Yeah, absolutely. You put, you put as much. Yeah. And, 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 that's, and that's actually really part of the larger yeah part of the larger point here. I mean, and, and if you look at it from a sideman standpoint, we're, we're at the stage now where, you know, I think it used to be, you know, credits were credits. It would like, it would be great to be getting a credit. But we're at the point here now where side artists are, um, uh, side artists are, um, you know, now have the opportunity to be paid, you know, either you know, directly or indirectly for their contributions. So making sure that as a sideman that you're credited appropriately, you know, properly on a recording is probably more critical now and going forward than it really, than it really has been in the past. Well, and in fact, there's, there's some metadata that's getting really granular, in particular for jazz. Like we're being asked who's playing the sax solo on track nine, you yeah. know, and we're asking, they're, they're asking us to put that kind of information into, you know, into, our metadata is like this massive spreadsheet of, yeah. of information, and we're creating more and more and more columns in that spreadsheet just to simplify it, you know, for discussion. To, to yeah, you you can actually imprint all and of this at your master. If you're organized with your information, your mastering engineer will be able to put a lot of this essential information into the digital master. Um, there's something Danny's saying that's really important there, and it, if we use the example of um, the relationship between Sound Exchange and the AFM and SAG AFTRA fund, this this five percent that is sent for non-featured artists is basically for backing vocalists and session musicians. And one thing that I see a lot of you don't do is um, say you play saxophone, but maybe you played hand percussion on a track as well. You claim that performance as well. You did some spoken word on it, you claim that too. You might have multiple performances on the one track. The more detailed and granular you could be about that information, the more you're protected and getting as much as you can back. Well, in and this... In the yes, you can, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's harder <laughs> retroactively. This is why I say now it's great, these, like the district kids, the CD babies, have a functionality that we didn't have 10 years ago to input this information. So I would say like always factor in that amount of time when you're taking your product to market as well. Don't leave it to the last minute, you know? And uh, just to add to that too, I mean, there, this metadata, like the m most I in major indies and major labels, et cetera, have all of this data. They've been sending this data for 15 plus years to iTunes, to Amazon to Spotify, to et cetera. It just hasn't been displayed yet. So a, a lot of this information is all out there, aggregated. Real, a lot of tender care has been put in place. Um, and it's, it's been, frankly, slower than I've even thought about the development and rollout of products to the consumers that allow for even just songwriter credits have only gone up on, right. I think, Spotify a year and a half ago or That's something right. like that, which is kind of shocking in a way that the songwriter information hasn't even been available. But it's complicated for them to do that. They're getting this different songwriter information from each of the publishers of each of the songwriters. Sometimes it says uh, M. Davis versus Miles Davis or, or Beyonce versus, uh, you know, B. B Knowles or uh, Bob Dil Dylan versus Robert, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I think the, the more and more foundational information everyone puts in place now, I think there's going to be more and more that you, you uh, see rolled out over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd just one like more to add one thing. In the last negotia negotiation with the AF of M, they backed down from the revenue reuse on streaming, and they gave in to having everybody's name on the contract so that, it, so that that's, that's covered the mega data will be covered on every studio, every studio session, and it's 
it's the, the contractor's job to make sure that all of that information <coughs> is posted with the AF of M or SAG or AFTRA. So it also, it, there's a, a plan, in, a plan if, if we would just follow it, if people would join the union, if record labels will become signatories to the union, all of that could be revenue streaming and for future use for, I don't know, 99 years or yeah, something. Yeah, more, more benefits of, of joining the union. You had a, a question back there, and then if we could switch over to the MMA and the, ML, the MLC after this. So <coughs> I haven't seen anything in terms of databases getting corrupted that are being created. I mean, there have always been people that hop on other people's copyrights. We hear about that all the time, you know, people claiming other people's recordings and, and monetizing them. This happens, on, uh, you know, on YouTube, it happens all over. Um, I do, I do want to say, I think, um, and I don't think this answers your question, but I, I think that the, the we've been talking to the DSPs ever since probably 2004, 2005, when iTunes started up about putting this metadata on their services because I believe not only um, is it important that everybody be credited just because they did the work, but also because I think it's a discovery uh, opportunity. I know I found so many records because of this bass player or that drummer or, or, or and so on and so forth. So I, I think this is, this is something we really have to focus on. But I don't, I don't know, I mean, I hear from my labels um, a lot that you know, people are claiming their recordings, and then you have to go through that whole notice and takedown process. We yeah. um, we we have seen. I don't. Uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I'll use the word corrupted, but I don't mean it in like it's you know an intentional corruption, right? But we have seen, um, you know, at Mac Avenue where suddenly something has changed in the Amazon system or the iTunes system with one of our releases or a series of releases and have traced it back to you know some metadata that got dropped out right and I think that's probably what you know what you're referring to and there's no question that in the you know our experiences in the digital in the digital age um, as we're improving these systems and as we're updating them and as there's billions probably lines of <laughs> Excel you know spreadsheet data that's changing hands that it gets corrupted in the process somewhere, right? Um, we've had titles disappear completely from, you know, from the services that were just there last month. And then we have to chase it down through our, through our distributor. And there's a modern version of this problem now, just to, you know, just to tell kind of a funny story, but now with, um, you know, with voice activation through Amazon and Alexa, you know, Alexa 
and you know the home pod um, your you know your metadata is now audible you know and some time ago we started sending you know mp3 files to the major services so they could pronounce so that the uh, you know pronunciation of our artist names were correct right so if i was asking alexa to play julian lodge it wouldn't play julian lodge right it was super frustrating until i said alexa play julian loggy <laughs> and then alexa played julian lodge right and so we had to go back through the system the same thing happened with cyril ami right play cyril amy and it works fine but her name is cyril ami and if you say it that way alexa wouldn't recognize it so we had to go back through the system and figure out how we could correct this. So we're sending MP3 files now, you know, with the actual, you know, pronunciation so that so it gets right. That's like a modern day metadata problem, right? That's a real world thing that, you know, that we're that we're dealing with. And it'll change overnight. Six months later, Julian Lodge wouldn't play suddenly on Alexa. It just disappeared. Like what happened? We just fixed this, right? <laughs> and so and here we come back at again. So it's not just you know as we're going forward, it's not just you know actually Excel spreadsheet data. I'm going to pause on the questions for a moment so that we can get to some of the the publishing issues because we've got another section here to to here to talk about. And Bob, I'm wondering if I could turn it over to you, sure. and give us an overview of the Music Modernization Act, which was passed in 2018, and the um, music licensing collective, which is um, you know, which is an, an outcome of the of that act. Yeah, I, I think if you don't mind me stepping back a little bit from that, even I think it's important to realize that on the uh, to just highlight that on the publishing piece, on the on the composition and songwriting piece, you're you're really talking about a number of different rights and different that are being licensed, to f and it it can get quite complicated, arguably. Um, but I'm going to focus on the U.S. just for a minute, and I, I'll just run through what those at the high level those <coughs> rights are. One is the pu public performance right. So, mo so most, it's a, many at least are you know registering with ASCAP, BMI, CSAC uh, to handle their performance rights. So those are the you know, radio royalties, et cetera, um, um, and general licensing re related, you know, uh, public performance uh, income. There's mechanical, which is the reproduction. There is sync rights, so you have the right to go license a sync in a, a audiovisual um, work, uh, like a commercial or a t film or TV um, use. Uh, you have print rights, so to to for the actual notation, etc. Um, and then there is um, what am I forgetting? There's grand rights. Um, so I guess a I would I would say it's really important to Generally, a, a music publisher will handle all of these rights Packaging for you. So, Packaging. I'm sorry. Packaging rights. Well, there's the. Uh, well, I, I said grand rights, but oh. there's you can uh, there's the lyric rights and, and right which I'm which kind of I would put under a subset of uh, print rights. But um, so, a if you if you have a music publisher or some sort of entity, um, there's a number of them on here where you can kind of have a largely a plug and play kind of service where they go register your compositions around at different societies and, and and whatnot you can have a solution that pr presents you with a um, just like with a label can 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 um, effectively manage and administer all of your your composition rights um, if you're an independent and you want to kind of go go you know piece by piece here and try to do it all yourself a, I would, uh, you, 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 you pretty much have to register with a PRO, so it, if, you don't, if you haven't done that, I would do that. Um, on the mechanical piece, you know, for on-demand streaming, you really have two rights uh, that are invoked w uh, in the publishing side. You have both a public performance and you have a mechanical right. On the mechanical side, historically those were handled via compulsory licenses where the services like Spotify and Apple would have to go either secure a license directly with you or they would have to go uh, file a compulsory um, notice of intent um, to, to get a, a license that is available um, through, through the copyright law. Um, and as long as they fulfill a whole number of um, fairly stringent um, requirements. That became a real mess, I think, as many of us know, um, which resulted in a number of lawsuits, a, lo a lot of royalties disappearing or not finding their way to the right people. 
Um, and it was not good for songwriters, it was not good for publishers, and it was not good for uh, streaming services who just wanted to, you know, I think in their view, put, have a comprehensive catalog offering to make available to consumers across the board. Um, so that and, n and numerous other kinds of uh, issues in the industry led to, after, after an incredible amount of hard work, uh, the Music Modernization Act. I'm gonna focus on the mechanical piece of that, um, um, and I'll, I'll try to be brief, Denny. <laughs> um, but, but essentially, what that created was, uh, again, on the mechanical piece, was a, uh, a, a, a new nonprofit collective called the Mechanical Licensing Collective that allows for, that provides for a single shop for uh, blanket licenses uh, to be issued to, uh, to digital services. Um, that, uh, that was passed in October of 2018, and that will go into effect January 1st of next year. So we have less than a year to go. Um, the, the, the key thing to, to realize with that is what that collective has done is, well, it's really building up an organization from the ground up, but that uh, about, I think roughly in, in November, uh, we announced that we've partnered with uh, the Harry Fox Agency and Consensus and some other partners uh, as just as part of the initial group to uh, provide the backbone for that, uh, for that service, meaning it will, will essentially be a database that, that handles all of the, the rights management um, component, but that also mean, and it will handle all the royalty distributions from there. So the good news is, uh, the, the Harry Fox Agency and Rumblefish and Consensus already handle Spotify, they already handle Apple and many, many other services. Many of you probably know that organization. Um, so the, they will be building off of that and, uh, and the Mechanical Licensing Collective will, will, will be building a whole new experience for songwriters and publishers to go register works, to go claim recordings and associate recordings and covers of, of, their, uh, of their works to the actual parent work. And ultimately for all of the royalties to flow in a much, hopefully much more um, streamlined way with one-stop shopping essentially. In the past you had to go register all over the place. You had to go to each individual label. You had to go to numerous vendors or directly to services. This should really be from a mechanical perspective uh, the, uh, the, the, the key database that will, will make it much more easy for all of you to, to collect your royalties from all of these different services. And, and so if I'm Amazon or Apple, instead of paying publishers and songwriters individually on streams, I'm then paying into a, a collective, right? Yep. And then that collective is, dis is matching the funds and distributing it out to songwriters and publishers, is that right? For statutory, yes, exactly. For, for audio-only streaming that is licensable under the, under the uh, 115 of the Copyright Act, that is absolutely correct. So, so in theory, um, and there, by the way, I should note that they're paying for all of this. So there's no commissions coming out of the royalties being earned. They're paying you know, millions of dollars a year each for uh, essentially to fund this entity, which is they to their benefit. They being? The digital services, the yeah, Apples, yeah. Pandora, Spotify, YouTube. Um, and again, the idea is to streamline the, the, the whole flow of rights and your royalties. Very good. Wow. Everybody get all that? Sorry if I went a, a, <laughs> little, a, a little crazy there. Um, a lot of money. money. Um, so, but the, the key thing is, again, if you're already registering, if, you're, or if you're, you or your publisher is already registering works, I'd be shocked if they're not already, already registering with the Harry Fox Agency. Um, the Harry Fox Agency also allows you to go in and register things one off pretty easily, though, you know, you can anticipate a, uh, a uh, you know, a point where we want to make sure that things are crystal clear super streamlined and one-stop shop for people. So there'll be a portal in the future that will allow really simple uh, registrations of works. So no matter, uh, no matter your technical sophistication, it'll allow for more, more robust uh, you know, sending of, of metadata feeds and whatnot. 
um, and it will allow for uh, a claiming portal that will help you try to find, again, recordings that, you, that may not have been paid in the past. And, and while this is a, you know, a massive undertaking, yeah. really, there's a model for this in Europe, right? Is, you know, this is the way that publishing and songwriter royalties in general are distributed in the EU, right? Yeah, in the EU, it's a, it's a little bit different, um, where it's, broadly speaking, because things have gotten, get a little complicated, but um, broadly speaking, in the same way that ASCAP or, and BMI and CSAC will, will handle, let's say, um, the licensing of general licensing, so for, let's say, bars and restaurants and whatnot, you'll have let's say uh, PRS in the UK that will, will has historically gone and licensed um, the mechanical and the performance right, so all the rights to a, a specific service. It's gotten a little complicated over time because you've had, you've had different, as you've had global platforms, you've, you've had different entities, including uh, my company, um, where you want to be able to have a global license, one license, and not go through individual societies. So all in the societies that you were mentioning on the on the um, on the um, right. on the neighboring yeah. right side, you know, I think there's two hundred and there's a crazy in there. ten or twelve or something like that uh, publishing so related societies around the world. So. Um, I'm what? I, I asked you to direct your attention to the musicians in the house that have products that they can. Sure. I look around and I see many friends of mine that are musicians and they have contacts. Yeah. How can they protect them? How can they protect their content? Yes. Well, I think that you the that for the these are these are statutorily licensable uses. The number one thing I would say is that you need to make sure that you're registering your works with the, with the mechanical licensing collective so you receive your royalties from them. The, currently, the way to access that income, this is all changing next year, but... How is it changing? So, so well, well the, the biggest fundamental difference is right now the ownership is predominantly on the platforms to register this information and, and, and get the money to the bodies that need it. And right now, you, in America, it's Harry Fox, it's Harry Fox and it's music reports. Um, through both of those portals, you will get um, the statutory 115 NOI notices. Um, a lot of people, you might see them come through your mailbox. You get letters and letters saying iTunes wants to put this track on their, their thing. Right now, that's the only way to claim that money unless you have a publishing administrator or some other intermediary doing it for you. But you can join direct to music reports. You can have an affiliate account with Harry Fox, where currently you can do that so you have some control. The, the difference of them understanding right with the uh, Mechanical uh, Collective is that um, the ownership now really comes back to you, the rights holders and the, the creators. Uh, it's on you to get this information correct and to the mechanical licensing collective rather than the other way around. That's what a blanket license means. Spotify will no longer have to come and say, hey, can we put this on our platform? Uh, am I right? Is that a good? So you're suggesting there's a time frame that in the future we will be able to do this information to, whom? to the mechanical licensing collective right now your options are to join music reports and join Harry Fox as an affiliate and then go into their systems and use the same search and claim function um, I, I have it's really about here. registering archiving taking your your composition information and registering it in their database it should be that simple as a, as a first step yeah when you say musicians in the room though, you're referring to composers or you're referring to players? Oh, I think the players are the ones in my opinion that haven't received their due yet. Right, well so players are not covered by the MMA, that's for composers. That's, we were touching on that more with the yeah. neighboring rights. So that, um, that's where our industry so. gets really complicated because yeah. the actual <laughs> players are covered by the recording side and composers are covered by the publishing side. 
covered in the MMA? Well, actually, the MMA um, took two components from the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, one of which was called the Classics Act, and the other was called the AMP Act. So the AMP Act covers producers. The Classics Act covers pre-72 recordings, um, which was a big win, actually, in the MMA for the recording side. And um, so if anybody here has recordings that were made before 1972, I think it's February 2nd, 1972, something like that, I can't remember. That's um, right. the, um, they were previously not covered by federal law. They were not protected at all. So radio, serious, anybody could play your recording digitally and, and you wouldn't get paid. Now you can get paid. Um, still don't get paid on terrestrial radio in this country, but you do get paid for digital plays. So, but in terms of um, uh, you know performances, if you play on a record today, it's not going to be affected by the MMA per se. Let's um, take. We've got ten minutes here. Let's open up the room for uh, for questions. If you guys could come to the microphones, that would be super helpful. There's a mic right there for questions, so that way everybody in the room can can hear. Um, hi. hi. Good morning. Great. Great. Um, there's two questions. The easy song licensing I've been using because it's very inexpensive and it's easy to do as opposed to Harry Fox. Sometimes it's a little complicated. Also, Jazz Rack, you guys haven't mentioned Japan. Well, we we would have to basically publish a mini book to, to cover all the societies <laughs> comprehensively. Um, on the on the handout, there's an yeah, example of you know societies and and um, yeah. and then and there's plenty of places societies. you can go to get this, like the information on who the bodies are. Look, Wikipedia is actually very good for information and all these different societies and stuff. I'm I would like to quite ask you though. You you mentioned what song license easy song licenses. Are you talking about? Um, actually licenses that you're soliciting for cover songs and stuff rather than registering your own stuff? I wasn't aware of. I'm paying to, I'm paying to license. Well, I, I think generally the, the difference is that, that that's, that's a, it's a choice. It's you, just like Song Trust, for instance, on mechanical rights. Now you can pay them a percentage, I think it's 10%, and a, a joining fee, and they'll do all that heavy lifting for you. That can be valuable if you have a lot of income. If you're an artist starting out, I generally think it's good to learn how to work with these societies direct because you're just giving away 10% of, you know, nothing at the beginning, really. Um, In other words, if I record something, instead of paying Harry Fox for a license, I pay Easy Song license. Well, they do, but they're, they're, you're paying an <coughs> extra fee to them to go to Harry Fox. Depending on whether you're making physical or just digital product these days, if you if it's just digital product you're doing, DistroKid, CD Baby, you can get that mechanical license right there on the platform without using a third party. Um, yeah, but uh, other services like that are definitely third parties that you're going to be paying an additional fee on. So it's about time versus. Yeah, no, you definitely won't be paying money. No, absolutely impossible. That's what I'm doing. You're not kidding. <laughs> That's impossible. Maybe I'm not doing it Harry Fox, I'm are, sure. Harry Fox are the only people in, currently in America that can issue a mechanical license. Nobody else can. No, no publisher can, anyone can. No, well, yeah, well a public, yeah, if, if, uh, you could go direct to a publisher who represents a catalog. That's a different thing, but you're talking about a third party that doesn't represent I'm not familiar the right with holder. the service. I, yeah. I, think, I think that's what you're talking. There's a few of those services now, um, but I generally you're paying an extra fee. You can't, you can't negate what the publisher or Harry Fox might need as their advance or I think, um, if I'm understanding you correct. Well, this is it's a service. I'm saying it's a service. They're saying, "Hey, we'll umbrella over this and do it for you." But I, I just want you to understand, you're not paying less for that because they will have to pay whatever the rate the publisher or Harry Fox says is 
and there's a statutory rate for mechanical licensing, isn't there? So well, yeah, I just I think what you may be saying is that, the, that, that there may be a fee for the, the, the yeah. that they're charging Service is a, fee. As low, a lower fee than what Harry Fox charges on top of the license itself potentially. But I, I, I just don't know enough yeah. about that service yeah. to know exactly how to compare it with the Harry Fox agency. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. So I have a uh, small one, one person in-house label. That's it. Yeah. Is there kind of a worksheet or something that where I can find out everything I need to register, like you know, besides the licenses and that sort of thing, but to get with whatever organizations that are administering royalties and that kind of thing? Any place I can get like a worksheet where I can know that I'm getting my royalties well, from we everywhere? We've tried. To we've tried to cover quite as much as we can on, on two pages on, right. on that sheet. That will give you the sort of entry level. Go look at Sound Exchange and your. PR right, I'm with sound exchange and all that stuff. Yeah, right. uh, um, there's a couple of um, tech entrepreneurs that are actually quite good who who will give you a good roadmap. I think we've included them here: mm -hmm. Ari Hertzstand and Day Bogan. Um, Day Bogan is quite an interesting character because he came up with a technology called um, Tune Registry to try and centralize your metadata needs before you push it through to all these platforms. So mm -hmm. I would suggest maybe looking at their websites and okay. the information's on there because they can break it down in real sort of layman's terms as to step one, register here, step two, you know. Okay, all right, great. Yeah. And, uh, and to get back on the metadata issue, I just wanna know how to make sure that all of the players are covered with in the royalty stream the best way to do it is by having split sheets and collaboration agreements when you're in the studio. So at that time? Yeah. So nothing, nothing retroactively I can do It's, it's always harder retroactively, and especially yeah. when it comes to like songwriting splits and stuff, people might maybe right. not feel the same well way when the Well, the songwriting the aspect of it is pretty covered. Yeah. I mean, I've generally only collaborated with one person, maybe two. That's all covered. They're yeah. all covered under the publishing agreements and that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's just I'm just talking about the general me metadata who's on the session, where it yeah, was recorded. Yeah, so you have a about. simple one sheet, um, what we generally call a split sheet, and that will have all that information where it was recorded, who attended the session, who performed on the session. Okay. And, and do you have a distributor? Yes. That, that so you, so your your distributor probably has some type of a portal or a spreadsheet or something where all of this information should be put in, yeah, including know. including <laughs> this, including what, what, the side What net. distributor are you using? City Hall right? Records. City Hall Records. So that's? Uh, it's out of the Bay Area, San Francisco Okay, Bay so Area. you're not, it's not what they call a DIY, like a CD Baby or a DistroKid? No, no. Or well, I do that as well. Oh, do you? I do well, CD certainly DistroKid. And there I have metadata listed. Yeah, DistroKids have a great function. But none of the session data, none of the who the players are. CD oh, Baby doesn't do that. So. No, I, I, I feel like it might have just started in that. DistroKid yeah. does it very well. They have a pull down <laughs> menu. But as soon as you register on DistroKid, one thing will come up and you have to, at the minimum, you have to register one songwriter. And then it gives you the option to say, hey, do you want to re register an engineer, a musician? Uh, yeah, you should I you should ask City Hall what they're providing to the what metadata they're providing to the digital service providers. Okay. just ask them. Start start there because that's your intermediary. Sure. If they're distributing you digitally, y you should you should know what metadata they're providing to the DSPs. Okay, they that's pretty much they pretty much have the, just the Amazon Amazon component. Okay. The rest I, do through I would eBay. still ask that ask that question. Start there, and sure. if it doesn't look like the metadata is clean, request to fix that, and in you know in some way, okay. right? Provide a spreadsheet to them that has all the the metadata. On. There's a couple metadata resources on this sheet too Great. that you can that you can use. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Great yeah. question. You guys, hear me? Okay. Uh, I'll do this. Uh, I'm. Uh, coming out with a digital only release. I have a PDF one sheet with all the credits that I've given to the radio hosts and, and all concerned. How important do you think a digital booklet is uh, these days to include uh, when I distribute to CD Baby or I post it on Bandcamp uh, for the digital rights that you're talking about? I, I've embedded, I, uh, I 
ISRC codes into each of my tracks with my engineer, mm -hmm. but the uh, sideman data is not on there, which they know about. So, um, the sideman data is n is not on the one sheet. Is it's on the one sheet, absolutely, but okay. not not in the uh, not in the actual digital files of the recorder. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's okay, not embedded in the map. So, uh, I I believe in liner notes. I think giving the listener some background information, of course, I, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with me there. It's a matter of uh, when I need to find out who's on a record, I just Google it like everyone else, and I, I find out personnel. But I like to give my listeners at least some kind of background on the tunes, where it was recorded, what I was having yeah. for lunch, that kind of thing. Yeah. But but what do you guys recommend? Is it is it worth the expense? And then how is that handled? I, I know that uh, iTunes or I, uh, uh, Apple Music have the option of buying a or include a digital booklet. I'm just wondering how that affects my, um, somebody calls up my name, it, it seems we're like people are picking up my recordings anyway. Yeah, we're not, we're not even doing digital booklets anymore. The, you know, okay. basically the, you know, the research has been that there weren't enough fans that were really downloading them. I didn't find you know? that either. Yeah. yeah, so it's, you know, we, we were doing it for every release in the early, you know, in the early stages and now we're really not doing it anymore. And that information is you generally we make available as much as we can online, right. you know, and uh, and then obviously that's the conversation about metadata here too. I mean, I miss liner notes, right? I mean, that's, yeah. you know, I think all, you know, probably most of us in this room have some experience, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember these days anyway, you know, have some experience with, you know, reading liner notes and finding out who played drums on track seven and who produced the album and who engineered it and all that. And so I'm, I miss that and, and I'm looking forward to the solution and there will be one. I look forward to, forward to the solution for that. But right now it'd be a personal preference for you, but there's not, that right now there's not a lot of companies that are providing digital, you know, digital booklets. Okay, yeah. thank you. For, you thank know. you. Probably one more question, and then we're and then we're out of time. But I, th I think the panelists can hang for a few minutes afterwards and answer questions, you know, individually. Hi, uh, I'm a little confused uh, with the PRS. Um, you work with PRS in the UK. I, I personally do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I just happened to. Uh, I was born in the UK, and I I, wor I did a lot of my work there. So I initially signed up with PRS and PPL and MCPS in the UK. So that's just to start. So how does PPL different than PRS? PPL is the mechanic, is the, um, sorry, the um, PRS is for publishing, for songwriting, for as a composer, right. and that's the performance right. So if something gets played on Radio 1, I get my money through uh, PRS. In fact, if it gets played <coughs> on radio anywhere in the world, if it gets played in a dress shop or whatever, I get my money through PRS. If, um, if it's sold on a, on, on, on a CD or vinyl, I get it through MCPS, and PRS and MCPS are basically one company now. And, um, uh, but uh, that's for the song, for the composition, but if the actual performance, the playing, producing, whatever, then I get paid through PPL. So it's, it's exactly the same as um, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, for the publishing side, for the songwriting side in this country, and sound exchange for the performance side. So sound exchange is basically equivalent to PPL. ASCAP, BMI, CSAC are basically equivalent so to PRS. So do you register with PPL separately than PRS? Yes. Yeah, I did, yeah. I mean, actually now I think they coordinate, but I, I in the beginning, um, a, a PRS, MCPS, and PPL were separate when I, when I signed okay. up. Because we, our, our first albums came out in 1998 and Expansion Records you know, was handling it in the UK and he suggested that we join PRS, which I did, and we could go back and retroactively claim That's uh, correct. You know, any royalties. Sure. But for the last two albums, they were just released in the US here and we had nothing to do with Expansion. So do we still, uh, should we still try and go back to, well, to you, PRS? You should, you should register um, all your material, if you're already a member of PRS and PPL, anyway, anyway. I would register with them anyway because the other component of this is where your music is getting played and where your music is okay. getting sold. Okay. Um, one thing that we've not had the time to touch on it today, but you can in an instant like that, you can join PPL in the UK and you can join Sound Exchange. They have what they call international mandates for collection. Okay. 
So you can tell Sound Exchange, hey, I only want you to collect in America. And you can go to PPL. And it, let's say you've got a lot of radio play and right. airplay in the UK, right. like with Ralph T's label. <coughs> it would be, um, that would be a time where P being a member of PPL and PRS would be beneficial to you okay. as well. So there's those considerations as well, depending okay. on where you are in your career. Okay. And you get paid faster if you do that. Yeah. So, you know, if, you, if you're getting a lot of play in Germany and you join the German organization, you would get paid more quickly than if it has to filter through, um, you know, a partner organization in whatever country you're based yeah, in. Yeah, because we're getting a lot of airplay in Switzerland now, but I know nothing yeah. about Well, the, the, the other side is, is, is um, PPL, and I feel like, I feel like um, the Swiss PRO as well, are, um, they go back six years in terms of back royalties compared to, I think it's three years here okay. for most of the platforms, so. Yeah. Okay, great. So you'll want to contact Suiza in Switzerland. Yeah, in Zurich. I want to uh, thank this esteemed panel of experts here for donating their time this morning. I hope that you all found this conversation useful. It can be complicated. I think all of us up here know that. And thank you for attending. Thank and you. thank all of you, thank you for, for joining us here this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you, Benny. Thank you, Denny.